Okay. Hey there, everybody. It's Russ from Path Less Peddled, and I'm super excited about today's live stream. So a couple months ago, I put out a video called Your Tires Are Lying to You, where we had Josh uh, from Silka kind of really break down lots of misconceptions about tires and tire pressure. And in total, it was a 30 minute video just nerding out about tire pressure. Uh, I thought some of you would be interested in it, but to date it has 83,000 views. <laughs> so, <laughs> so apparently people are super into uh, nerding out with tire pressures on about tire pressure as well. So um, if you guys uh, just, so I'll do a little bit of housekeeping. If someone in the chat can tell me if everything is sounding good, just uh, let me know. And before we start, uh, I do want to thank uh, our Patreon and PayPal supporters. You guys are making uh, this content happen, uh, especially now. <laughs> Since uh, COVID, our AdSense has like run off the cliff. <laughs> so you guys make this possible. And uh, if you're on Patreon, then you got the invite to, to join this uh, live stream on, on Zoom and ask Josh your questions after we do the formal Q&A. So a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, jo Josh and I are going to talk for about 20, 25 minutes. Then I will open up uh, the, the, the floor to questions, answering the, the folks uh, on Zoom first and going to YouTube chat. And yeah. So with all that said, uh, Josh, thanks again for joining us uh, on the YouTube channel. <laughs> no, thanks for having me. That's great. <laughs> Let's face it, we, we don't have much else to do. Right? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's true. Um, so uh, our, our last video did really well. I mean, amazingly so. Have you guys gotten lots of feedback from that video? Oh, tons. Yeah, people yeah. talk to me about it all the time, all the time. Yeah. They're like, so, you're, the, you're the tire guy I saw on yeah. the YouTube. <laughs> oh yeah, no, and we, we see it, it, people throw it up in forums and things all the time, like watch this, you know, or, or you'll see people say, no, you're wrong, here's the proof, <laughs> and, it'll, uh, and it'll pop up. So no, it's fun, and it, it, uh, it's also, it drives a lot of traffic to our YouTube channel where we kind of nerd out a whole order of magnitude deeper on the, mm -hmm. the even more science-y math mathy stuff um behind what we talked about so uh yeah it's been it's been awesome and right it is it's great to have people you know grab me at event well not any, not at currently but you know at events people are like hey you're the tire guy <laughs> <laughs> very cool fun. very fun yeah so speaking of uh sciencey math stuff uh i i am not a sciencey math guy i'm a literature major by by college i guess and I thought it would be fun to start out and really kind of define supple in terms of science terms. And you used a phrase in the last video and it was a un, undamp spring rate. Would that be kind of the, the science phrase for, for suppleness? And if you could unpack that phrase a little bit. Yeah, it, essentially yes, um, as we've come to define it. And I think, um, interestingly, you know, for having had pneumatic tires for like 135 years, we, we've never really defined supple before. I think we all use that term since the seventies. Um, but you know, then we still all bought tufos and pumped them to like 150 PSI and thought that was really fast. Uh, and of course the, the tufo is a highly damped <laughs> tire, uh, which makes it quite slow. And so, yeah, uh, the way to think of the tire is it's like a suspension fork. That's this big. Um, and what you're really after, you think of the two things going on in your suspension fork, uh, really there's three, um, but we can break them into two categories. You've got the spring rate, right? And that's the, either the, the mechanical spring or the air pressure. Um, you know, that's, that's a really efficient thing. Uh, you know, that the air, uh, an air spring is, is super efficient. It has very low, almost no natural damping. Uh, and then you've got a damper right? Because in a suspension fork or an automotive suspension, you've got enough movement that if you don't put some controls on it, um, certain harmonics or certain exciting frequencies can really just get it going. You know, you see a car on the highway with bad shocks, right? And it's just doing one of these over the bumps. Um, you know, that that's essentially an undamped spring in a car and it can cause all sorts of problems. Um, and then the other thing you have going in there is friction, uh, which is a hysteretic component, just like the damping. And the, the friction and the damping um, or essentially they're controlling the movement in the suspension fork. But in the case of your tire, uh, that's where the rolling resistance comes from. Um, and the thing that you see in 
crappy tires. Um, let's just call them that. Uh, tires with high hysteresis or high damping um, is that if you think of, you know, an imperfect surface, uh, you know, like a lot of little bumps, the tire can get compressed, but because it, it compresses at one speed and it, it rebounds, it comes back at a slower speed. What can happen is it, as the frequency gets higher, um, the tire doesn't bounce back. And so it's basically just skipping across the top of the different bumps, right? In, in, in a mountain bike, uh, if you have your fork over damped, um, we call that packing. If you've ever hit washboard and your fork just packs, you know, it just gets like, you just lose travel. Well, mm -hmm. the same thing happens in the tire. And if I were to graph it, we've got a, uh, on our uh, YouTube channel, a great episode on hysteresis where we show this graph. Um, it, it, when you graph hysteresis, I'm trying to do it on my camera here. Um, <laughs> you might have one, one pathway out at one speed, and then it comes back on a slower path like this. Um, and so what happens is it, it, slow speeds, you can make this loop um, and you're just losing the energy and fun math thing. You know, if you all had to integrate uh, in calculus, if you integrate the area between those two curves, that's the energy loss. Well, what happens at high frequencies um, is that you get to the, the peak, you know, the max compression, and then there's not enough time for it to return. And so you can end up with a spring rate that's almost vertical. Um, and so that's why, you know, a, uh, a high quality tire at, you know, 70 PSI or, or, you know, whatever you're on. And then you put a crappy tire on at the same air pressure. And all of a sudden the ride quality of the bike just goes to hell. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. By all the stuff that Josh is telling me, the <laughs> spring rate of the tire um, is more important than frame material, right? It's more important than geometry. I mean, it's the most important thing. Well, but why does it not work with this crappy tire? Well, it's because in that crappy tire, you're actually in this zone where you've compressed the spring and now you're just hitting it compressed. Um, right. You know, so that's, yeah. So that in a very <laughs> long and roundabout way as I'm good at doing, that's sort of uh, why you want undamped, uh, you know, the perfect tire would spring back at exactly the velocity that it was impinged. Um, and, you know, as you find like that, that's why we go to higher TPIs. That's why mm -hmm. we go to latex. Uh, that's why, you know, the, the, we call them onion skins, the tires we use for like our record attempts. Um, they, they have no latex in the sidewalls even. Um, hmm. It's just the silk yarn um, because you just get the maximum um, uh, uh, rebound, right? The lowest possible damping, which not only brings you that supple ride quality, but also it, it soaks up less energy, right? And so that to right. me, that's the real beauty of the tire is, you know, when it, a tire is optimally designed and the perfect pressure is where it's the fastest. It's the most comfortable at that point. Um, it also has the best grip. And because of the way the rubber compounds are matched to, uh, to the, to ideal pressure load, uh, kind of load capacities, um, it also lasts longer. Right. And so it's right. one of those things that if you get that right, you actually end up kind of domino affecting like six other things in your favor. Right. Cool. Well, let's talk about uh, crappy tires. Like one of the, the big questions I get asked a lot is, yep. okay, you're, I'm just a regular consumer. I'm at the bike shop. I'm looking at a wall of tires. Like, are there any kind of indicators that, you know, bef you know, short of just buying and trying the tire that I should look for to, that would kind of tell me if, um, you know, this, the, the potential spring rate of the tire. Yeah. So there is a website, uh, a guy named Yarno Bierman runs a site called bicyclerollingresistance.com. Um, mm -hmm. Everybody uses it. I mean, I, you know, it, I'm at, you're at the Tour de France and people are like <laughs> looking at it on their phone. Um, it, it's a great site. The data there is, is only about half the story because he's testing on a smooth metal drum. Um, and so it's not giving you any information about like impedance losses or any of that stuff. Um, but it is indicative of the hysteresis of the tire. And, you know, typically the tire that's thinner, um, that has higher TPIs um, and is lighter weight uh, for its size is generally going to be the faster tire. So the, yeah. the best way to think of with tires is the more, the more stuff you put in there, the more interfaces, the more um, opportunities for these hysteresis uh, losses. Okay. So that's I've tried tires where it was nominally the same tire, but one was like a tan skin wall. Another one was black, had a black sidewall. Yeah. So would that like 
you know, slight touch of rubber affect um, kind of the, the feel of the tire? It, it depends on the brand. So some brands um, use essentially the same uh, exact construction for the tan wall and the black wall. And it's just a carbon black added to the, to the black wall. Um, in that case, it, it's no different. There are other brands that um, actually get the black sidewall with an extra coating of rubber. Um, and that is, that's going to add rolling resistance and take away from the suppleness. And, and typically the way you can tell those is if there's a weight difference, uh, mm. with the color variation. Okay. Cool. Um, so one of the, the most commonly asked questions from the previous video is, you know, we got a good, uh, understanding of what the high tire pressure limit means. And I believe it's, it's twice the amount of, or one half the amount of pressure would take to blow the tire off the rim. What does the low uh, kind of suggested tire pressure mean? So there's a couple of things in play there. The, uh, there is a, an ISO rule um, for low pressure that essentially governs, um, you know, and I can't remember exactly what the math on it is, but it, it's essentially the, uh, the pressure below which you're likely to roll it under in a hard corner. Um, okay. Now, the challenge with that is that the we are currently in committee dealing with ISO rules right now, but the, the rules that are have been in place are pretty old. And so they're oftentimes based on, you know, a, a whatever two inch mountain bike tire on a 17 C or a 19 C uh, rim, right? Which I don't think anybody's done now in 20 years. Um, or it feels like 20 years, it's only been like 10. <laughs> um, but you know, the, that's a rim narrower than than any of us are running uh, in road bikes, right? And so the there are some real changes that are going to come um, in terms of those recommendations as we get to tubeless and the beads fit tighter. Um, and as we have these wider rims where the, the forces are just different in cornering than back in the day where you had, you know, your tire on your rim was like a, like a giant overstuffed ice cream cone, you know, it was a huge <laughs> tire, little rim. Um, and the thing could really, you, you think of the mechanics, right? It, it could roll to the side and can really pull the bead out. Um, more easily as those things widen up, it kind of more parallelograms, uh, on mm -hmm. top of the tire and, uh, it, and it, it's just a different, uh, a different mechanism. Right. Um, do you know how does, I mean, we're seeing a trend towards wider rims. How, how does that ultimately affect the tire? So the wider rim lets the tire act as if it's wider, uh, than it is. And so you think that it's one of the problems we have with, with tire sidewall measurement versus actual measurement. Um, if you think of the way the tires made, you know, it, it, it's sort of like this, right. And they give you the width by saying, Oh, well, when the beads are at this width, the, t the casing will be this width. Right. But really the, like the tire manufacturers, they talk in uh, circumference, right. They talk in like, if you were to take that and flatten it, what would this distance be? Um, and so, you know, a 25 millimeter tire, uh, you know, like a Conti 4000 on a, a 15C rim of 10 years ago might measure 25. And from a pressure perspective at a certain PSI, the casing tension in there um, is, it's pretty simple math, right? It's like a Taurus with a 25 millimeter cross-sectional uh, diameter. Well, as you put that on a wider rim, it it grows this way and it effectively takes on um, a larger radius. And so, you know, that tire on a Envy AR 4.6 might measure 30, 31 millimeters. Um, and if it, and at that, you do the math on it and now it has the casing tension um, of a 31 millimeter tire. And mm -hmm. uh, that's really changes everything. Right. I mean, it's uh, it, it changes the the lateral squirm. Uh, it changes the vertical spring rate um, of the tire. And that's where I, you know, a lot of people, I think that I we see at events and things these last few years, you know, they've bought the wider tires, they've bought the wider rims, but they're still running the old air pressures. And so mm. effectively, you know, your stiffness has just gone through the roof um, on that tire. And, you know, that's where I, I know a lot of people say to me, oh, I, I, I put 30s on and that I just. I don't know. It's not that great. Like, oh God, you're killing, you know, you're running them at the pressure of, you know, a tire that's a, you know, a quarter narrower. Um, right. Yeah. You're, you're beating the crap out of yourself. <laughs> don't do it. 
So there's a lot of moving parts. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, like I said, it's, it's mathematically, it's quite, uh, it's quite beautiful, but yeah, a lot of moving parts. Yeah. Cool. Um, well, let's see the, another commonly asked question is, is there a general rule in terms of, uh, tire pressure difference between the front and the rear? Hello. Oh, Josh, you're, uh, let you see. Uh, Josh, you got muted. Oh, hold on. Self. Oh, there we okay. go. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. I, we, yeah. I, I think I have like three, <laughs> three zoom calls going in my house. So I think we dropped. Uh, in the gotcha. Um, <laughs> so you were asking front versus rear i think was where yeah was so going. is there like a you know if you're given a, a rider and and setting up the, the tire pressure like should yeah. should the the, tire, the front tire be you know have, le, have what percentage less P, psi than the rear yeah it our our opinion is pretty unique on that so the the conventional wisdom had been to take the front rear uh weight distribution and and just do a percentage um so if you look at uh, there's there's a ton of charts out on the the internet and um, that recommend that. And what we find is that there's two two problems that one when you descend, you think of the front wheel goes below the rear and there's a natural weight uh, shift onto the front wheel. Mm -hmm. So you know you on flat ground might be a 45 55 front to rear. Um, but as the road turns down, that might become 48 52 or 49 51. Um, and then what's the thing that you do when you're going fast downhill, you get low, right? Um, and of course that moves your weight further forward. And so generally what we find uh, using the pro tour as a great example, um, those guys are typically descending actually with higher front load than rear. Like they actually go maybe from a, you know, uh, 48, 52 to like a 52, 48, um, oh wow! <laughs> and so because of that, you know, we uh, use a little algorithm to kind of fudge that front tire pressure back up. Um, Cause of course it's when you're descending at high speed that you really, you really don't want that front tire squirming around under you. <laughs> um, so, you know, it, it, our calculator and the way we work the numbers tends to overinflate the front tire slightly um, for like on the tops kind of, you know, tooling around, um, but it puts you in a much better spot uh, for descending. Right. So, cool. But... Yeah. Um, so speaking of uh, uh, the Pro Tour and, and uh, calculating their tire pressure, you guys have a really cool tool on your website. It takes a lot of your, your knowledge <laughs> and, yeah. and, the, and the stuff that you've got, uh, you guys have researched and it has, has made it accessible to... Um, to the lay person. Can you talk a little bit about your tire pressure uh, calculator? Yeah. So, you know, there's really two parts of our business. Um, and one of them is we do a ton of consulting uh, at the pro tour with pro triathletes, um, th stuff like that. Right. And uh, so, you know, I'm at, I think every spring classic and tour and Olympics and our record and uh, you know, everything that people are doing where they, they need to, find an optimization for this problem. And, uh, and so over five or six years, you know, we've collected just thousands of these, uh, these data points from these optimizations. And we had the idea to essentially put that into kind of a huge plot uh, and then curve fit it by rider weight uh, and then parse the data in a different way by tire size. And so we've ended up with uh, essentially these curve fits from which we've, you know, you pull the equations out and can plug them in and basically extrapolate all the points in between. Um, and so it, it's pretty cool. It, it, it takes your weight, uh, your measured tire width, right? Cause it's, that's the important one. Like what's it caliper to on your rim? Uh, it, there's a surface. I think we've got nine surfaces. We're hoping to expand that. Cause that's honestly, the surface is the hardest part of the whole thing. Um, because it's me showing you a picture and going, does it look like this? Does it, right? <laughs> and, and what we're getting at with the surface, the, the tough one there is you're trying to get to the, um, what we call the RZ value, which is the kind of the average bump 
size in the surface, and then also the frequency of those bumps in the surface. Uh, you know, so you know some brand new pavement, uh, you know, actually has an RZ value because it may look perfectly smooth. I mean, it may have been steamrolled yesterday, but it now has it can have a lot of negative space in it. Mm -hmm. And depending on the size of the stone they use when they pave it, those negative spaces can be bigger. And of course your tire, you know, if you have a hundred PSI in a tire and a hundred pounds of load, it's got to make one inch of contact patch. Well, if a hole appears in the middle of that contact patch, the, the tire's got to deform to compensate. Right. And so um, th there's a ton of kind of balancing that, that goes on and getting the optimal pressure uh, for those surfaces. So we, takes that into play. We do uh, have a front rear weight distribution piece in there. Um, and we also have a speed because in the back end of the calculator, we're running another algorithm uh, that's based on energy um, for an eight millimeter impinging impact uh, based on another data set that we've got uh, where we can throw a flag and say like, oh, you are at a pinch flat risk. Uh, mm -hmm. Your weight, this surface, that tire, don't do it. Um, and then it's pretty cool. It'll actually calculate for you uh, how much more pressure you might, you would need to add to be safe. Um, or it'll give you a suggested tire width, uh, for that surface. And it's, it's all done mathematically, uh, through this algorithm. So, yeah, I'm going to share my screen real quick, just to show people what we're talking about. Uh, hopefully you guys can see the, the calculator. Um, so there looks like there's a, a free, free version and then, um, the pro version. And yeah, so this is a pretty awesome tool. What's the, do you know what the URL of, of the calculator is off the top of your head? I don't. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you, if you guys Google Soka Professional <laughs> Pressure Calculator, it will pop up. Yeah, it's there. <laughs> and definitely, definitely nerd out on that because I think that's like such an awesome uh, resource there. Uh, cool. Yeah, it's um, fun. I'll, I'll say too, you know, it, it, hidden in there because of the, the nature of how we built it. Um, I think you've got six uh, Perry Roubaix winners, tire pressures, you know, so if you, if you knew Peter's weight and, uh, and his tire size from things, you, you can actually throw that in there and go to cobbles and get <laughs> the number. Um, there's a couple of dirty Konza winners, tire yeah. pressures in there and size. And so it's, it's kind of fun. And, and those, like, as we were developing it as a sanity check for the math, you know, I had this little cheat sheet of, of about a dozen, um, just real life scenarios uh, that I would plug in there to make sure that, you know, the, as we built the tool that the math uh, was holding together. And so, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's fun. We've had uh, Taylor Finney actually said, Hey, yeah, I, <laughs> it's right. <laughs> <laughs> cool. So uh, I, there's a quick question in the YouTube chat. Uh, does the tire pressure calculator assume a tubeless setup or, and does that even matter? Yeah, no. So interesting. We get that one a lot. It actually doesn't matter. Um, okay. Back to the suspension fork uh, kind of analogy, the, the air pressure in the tire is, is controlling the spring rate. Um, and this is really at the core of it. It's a spring rate problem. Um, and so the tubeless, tubular, clincher, uh, different inner tubes, those are all changing the damping rate, uh, the, the hysteresis within the system, but the optimal um, the optimal air pressure is going to be the same. It's, it's kind of like you think about, you know, when you're setting up your suspension fork, you, you set your suspension up for your weight. And then if you change the damping, you don't then need to change the pressure. Um, hmm. And it's, right. it's kind of the, the same effect there. All right. Uh, cool. Uh, well, I think I'm going to open it up to the uh, Patreon supporters that are on the zoom call. So if you guys have a question, uh, I don't know if you can raise your hand. Um, I'll switch to gallery view. If you want to wave, then, I'll unmute you. Any questions, Nick, Craig, JP? No? Okay. Oh, okay, Nick, uh, let me unmute Nick. Sorry, this is my, all right, Nick, you have the floor. <laughs> cool. Thank you, Russ. Um, so Josh, just a, a kind of quick one uh, yeah. around, and I think you touched on it, um, but kind of why we still have in the Pro Tour uh, guys that get um, flats so frequently, right? Is it because they're right on the bleeding edge of, of that line of, uh, of your thin wall or your um, kind yeah. of, and is it the difference between maybe a, a surface change um, that mostly blows it? Or is it sometimes they just get flats? It's, it's interesting yeah. to still see so many flats in this day and age, I think. 
So. Yeah, I, I, a couple of things there. So, you know, the as we said, every layer in a tie, so you think you've got like your casing um, and most race casings are like three ply, uh, cotton, uh, maybe two and some of the lighter weight ones. Um, so you've got casing and then ideally in a race tire, you just put the tread on that, right? So you've got one glue interface between casing and tread and then the tread itself. And that's the minimal hysteresis you can have. Um, if you add like a, a, another casing ply or a puncture strip, like a breaker strip, they call it, that's just adding rolling resistance. Um, and so most pro tour tires have no breaker strip uh, for one. And then I think the other, which certainly leads to this, uh, the other one, really two components to that are they're going so much faster than we're going. And you think of it from an energy perspective, um, the, that energy equation is, uh, depends on velocity squared, right? So it is, you know, as they're going slightly faster, that energy is going exponentially higher. Um, and so hitting, you know, like you or me hitting a sharp rock, um, is one thing them hitting that same sharp rock at 50% faster is, you know, significantly more energy to, to puncture it. And then the third piece of it is really just the, the probability of having, you know, a, a given stage, you might have 180 riders riding the same patch of road for, you know, 150 miles. Um, you know, you think of, you know, you, your average group ride, right. You, you probably have in a week, one person puncture, you know, if, if you've got 25 guys riding and, and women riding every day for a week, you'll probably have one flat. And of course the pro tour is doing that in one stage. Uh, so I think that's, that's probably, probably part of it. Uh, I, I will say, you know, you're, this is the year or this was going to be the year where tubeless uh, started to take over. I know we, we have EF this year on basically uh, almost hundred percent tubeless. Um, and so I think that's going to help, um, for the teams that go tubeless and decide to run sealant. Uh, most of them honestly still hate the sealant. Uh, it's no secret. I'm on the record. I hate sealant myself. Um, <laughs> it's just nasty and dirty and I hate dealing with it. Uh, but I, th I think that will start to change uh, some of that, that puncture situation as well. Right. I know um, for the spring classics, the last couple of years, we started running sealant with bore in the tubulars um, and it's not good for the tires, but it really, dramatically reduced. You know, I think we went from, I think we had five or six flats throughout the classics a couple of years ago. And I think last year we had one. Um, so it, it, it really can't make a difference. All right. Cool. Uh, interesting question in the chat. Uh, someone asked, would pressures change depending on the TPI of different tires? No, the, the TPI again is, is more affecting the damping. Okay. Uh, than the optimal pressure. So, you know, there, there is some natural stiffness in the casing um, that I have heard argued and I have been involved in arguments where people have said, oh, uh, you know, a, a, a four ply 127 TPI tire naturally has some compressive stiffness to it, right? I mean, you can feel it with your fingers. Um, but when you think of the power of one PSI, uh, it's a lot, right? It's kind of surprising um, that when you actually try to equate that, it, I mean, a super stiff sidewall tire works out to be like a PSI uh, hmm. or I mean half, you know, you think of even an automotive tire, um, you know, you can deflect the sidewall with your finger and you just get a couple of PSI in it. And all of a sudden it's pretty darn stiff uh, for your finger. So, you know, maybe if you have the stiffest tire ever, <laughs> quarter PSI, half PSI, um, but otherwise, no, not, not that we see in the data. Mm -hmm. Um, let's see. Any other questions from, uh, uh, Sandro? Let me unmute you. Uh, okay. Ask away. Uh, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, nice to see everyone. Uh, weird times, but anyway, here <laughs> I go. Uh, so actually you answered one of the questions that I had and I was wondering, why don't we see more sealant in uh, tubular wheels? But I think you made sense. It's not good for the tire. So I did not know that. So thank you for answering that. Oh. The next, uh, the next thing that I had in mind was that uh, we starting to see more um, uh, hookless rims mm -hmm. for disc brake wheels. And obviously my first instinct when I heard about that, and I listened to a lot of podcasts way too more. I commute a lot. I live in LA 
you guys know the life we live here. Uh, so I listened to a lot of podcasts and, uh, yeah, the, my first instinct was like, wow, like without, without the hook on the rims and how's the tire even being stabilized. So I was just curious about what's your, uh, what's your take on these, uh, hookless rims yeah. and uh, on tubeless. And I, it, it's promoted as the future of this, this great, uh, rim. Mm-hmm. But is it, and why? And yeah, so I mean, a couple of things. The uh, I, I will say, long long term, without a doubt, hookless will win, um, and and hookless will win long term because it's it's quite a bit cheaper to make the rims that way. Um, to be completely transparent, you know that the the whole market will end up there because uh, you can just make uh, rims slightly less uh, with slightly less expense, and you can make them faster um, with a straight wall than a hooked wall. Um, the thing that needs to happen, and is it's happening now, uh, for hooked to really work, is uh, it actually. And you think of it, you know, if I've got, you know, say this is my tire circumference, right, and I can guarantee that that's not going to stretch more than some amount. If I can put that in a rim, that's and of course I, <laughs> that's very close to that same circumference for it to pull over the bead in one area, it actually has to pull inward everywhere else, if that makes sense. So as the, the rim, and th- this is how automotive tires work, as, as the rims are more controlled in their diameter and the tires more controlled in its diameter, the safer that, that system becomes. And th- this is a topic that we've debated for, I think, five years now in the ISO um, ETRTO uh, standards group um, nationally, because of course, the, the tire guys want the biggest tolerance possible for cost, right? Because tolerance is a nonlinear uh, cost driver. And of course, the rim guys want the biggest possible tolerance. <laughs> and so, you know, in an ideal world, you could make a tire within, say, plus or minus half a millimeter and a rim within, say, plus or minus half a millimeter. And you put them together and it, it would be impossible to roll the tire off uh, hookless. And so that's what we have to really drive into now. Um, I, I wouldn't say that we're there yet, but it's, it's coming in a couple of years. We'll be there. And I think we'll have hundred percent safety with hookless. Um, you know, the hook, the crochet style rim, which is actually what the C is at the end of hundred, uh, like 700 C or 650 C that's crochet, uh, which means hook. And that's really there, um, kind of as a, as a safety measure, uh, from the old days where tires were still largely handmade and the tolerance in the tire uh, was quite a bit larger than it is now. You know, I think the old school ETRTO standard was like plus or minus 1.5 millimeters of diameter in a tire. Um, so three millimeter window, that's, that, that's, you know, half the height of the hook. Mm. Right. And, uh, and now we're getting to tolerances that are more like plus or minus 0.75 or, um, you know, somewhere in that range. So, but yeah, and I would say in the near term, um, you know, if you're buying, reputable uh from a brand perspective you're fine right the 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 top brands are doing it really pretty darn well and they're also the ones in the iso committee driving the uh driving the specs cool uh any other questions from the the zoom zoom folks just wave your hand or or hit the okay i'm going to turn it over to youtube chat this is always scary (laughs) So if you were in the chat room in YouTube, uh, ask your questions. There are a couple of questions uh, I, that some people from Patreon want to know. This one I think is interesting. Does optimum tire pressure change when adding suspension? Bellmobiles and other recumbent mm-hmm. bikes have suspension because they're lying on their back and they have, they're fast and not necessarily for off-road. So does one search for smoothness, smoothness before or after the suspension? It, it can. Um, f- from the tire's perspective, um, you know, it, it is generally looking for kind of an optimal load rating. Uh, so you think of like, you know, the, the inside the door of your car, right? It's got the recommended tire pressures uh, for that size of tire, for that weight of, uh, of, of vehicle. And that's, that's really all about getting the optimal load rating in the rubber. Um, you know, one of the things that happens, uh, you think of the days where we all ran way too much pressure and you would get those... Um, kind of circumferential, those little micro cracks around the tire over time. And that largely was a result of the rubber breaking down in shear 
um, from being overly stressed locally um, and the casing not being able to respond. And so um, uh, that's a factor. But but yeah, I mean, you know, we had uh, like Team Sky at, at Roubaix a few years back brought those suspension bikes and we found that the optimal pressure in terms of speed on the different surfaces was still pretty similar. But it, if you think of, uh, and on our, we've got some videos and sites and we could probably look one up, but if, if you think of the a rolling resistance chart in the real world, it comes down with pressure, like it gets lower as pressure gets higher. And then you hit what we call impedance and it goes up again. And you're trying to find that optimal spot here. And what we see with suspension is it sort of takes that curve and it sort of flattens it this way so mm -hmm. that the cost of being wrong one way or the other is a little bit less. Um, and so like one of the things we decided uh, with the Roubaix suspension at Sky was that you could actually run the pressures a little bit higher uh, for the race so that if you did make it into that sprint on the velodrome, you would have a little tire pressure advantage there because they could lock the suspension out. And on the cobbles, you you actually end up with a slight pinch flat rim damage advantage um, because that suspension is just, it's, you know, if you do bottom it out, the suspension's giving the the rim the ability to kind of like get away from the bump in that instance. Um, and so, yeah, suspension uh, it, it maybe doesn't necessarily change that that correct value, but I, I love the flexibility that it gives you um, in terms of the ability to play around uh, there. Mm -hmm. you know, I've, I've often thought that uh, cyclocross uh, with even like a centimeter of suspension um, could really change the game there, right? From a, right. Typ typically lower pressures are faster, 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 and then you break something, right? It's like the <laughs> bay cobbles. Um, and so if you could add even just a centimeter of suspension um, it, it might give that rider the opportunity to say, go, you know, a uh, half PSI or one PSI lower without that, that failure risk, um, which on the course can, I mean, you know, I've, I've seen a, a PSI can be a couple seconds a lap, um, mm -hmm. on a lot of courses. So, so with that suspension that was on this team sky bike was, they were able to kind of lock it out on the fly, right? Yes. Or was it always active? Yeah. Yeah. Nope. They could lock it out. Yeah, which which is just the ultimate, right? For that yeah. scenario, <laughs> right? Because it's, it, you know, that I mean, that race in particular, it. Uh, I mean, you think it's got the worst cobbles of any I any race on earth, um, but then the, the majority of it is still on pavement. And depending on, you know, we talk a lot about wind directions and stuff. Depending on where the wind is coming from, the key moves often happen in the paved sections rather than the cobbles. Um, and then the fact that it ends on a concrete velodrome. Right, which probably has a, you know, 110 to 120 psi optimal pressure for sprinting, <laughs> really puts you in a bind, right? I mean, you you know, we we've got some riders that are optimal pressure on the cobbles of, uh, you know, pressures in the the 50s and 60s, right? And then you come to the sprint and and you could pick up a handful of watts, um, you know, a couple bike ceramic bearing upgrades worth of watts, um, <laughs> at that higher pressure, um, and of course you got to choose, right? You got to have one or the other. You can't get both. All right. So that's always made me wonder, you know, we've seen there's some technology that lets you monitor tire pressure in real time. Do you think we'll ever come to the point where the next big thing is being able to change tire pressure on the fly, depending on surface conditions? <laughs> it, there are technologies out there for it. Uh, and it's fascinating. I, uh, maybe someday, uh, probably not in my <laughs> lifetime because I, I don't see most people giving up their weight weenie fetish <laughs> anytime soon. Right. I mean, even those, those of us like myself who, who say weight doesn't really matter. It's still hard to not go, Ooh, you know, <laughs> 600 grams. Wow. That's, that seems like a lot. Um, so yeah, if, you know, if somebody developed a, a, a super lightweight system that could, uh, could make that work. Yeah. It, 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 in an event like that. And, and certainly, I mean, a lot of these, uh, you know, dirty Kanza and a lot of these, these long gravel events, my God, I mean, uh, Mm. It, it could be massive. I mean, it, it could be minutes uh, at yeah. almost like Kanza. Yeah. Probably, I think, like, maybe the, like, tunable suspension on the fly would might happen first, it seems I like. I think so, because <laughs> I mean, that, that technology is solid, right? You look right. at, um, I mean, that, you know, that was done in F1, my God, 40 years ago now. Um, mm -hmm. We've got it in commercial automotive. So, yeah, we'll, that, uh, there's, like, a magnetorheologic um, 
damping fluid that they can use and and uh the, the thing that sky had i mean that, that was really pretty slick um yeah i uh, I, I'd like to see it, but I, I do think there's something, uh, especially for like the kind of the, uh, I mean, honestly, it, it might have more uh, use in, in touring uh, a lot of the stuff that you're doing, right? Where, you know, the ability to kind of flip it to one air pressure for pavement and then see a, a trail that you want to get off on and just hit the button and have it go, you know, have it come out. I mean, the, the military had that in Humvees for, for years mm -hmm. for that exact reason, right? You could get it to one pressure drive it on the pavement and then, you know, lower it and drive it in sand. Cause it, I got, it can be a factor of two difference. All right. Um, yeah. I'd, I'd love to see it. I'd love to ride it. <laughs> cool. Uh, bringing it back to the folks on the zoom call, any other questions, just wave your ha arm or hand. Any other questions. Okay. Let's see what's going on in the YouTube chat. Um, it's like spinning plates here, spinning yeah. plates. <laughs> um, Cool. We've got some people from Australia in. Um, yeah, if you're on the YouTube chat, let us know where you're watching from. And also, if you've got any questions, feel free to ask away. Um, let's see. Well, I'll go. There's no pressing questions right now. I'm going to go to another one that someone wrote in. Um, Someone was kind of really curious about your what you were saying about latex versus uh, butyl tubes. Can you expand mm -hmm. like a little bit, a little bit, a little bit more on their differences? Yeah, so latex uh, ha is a much lower hysteresis material than uh, than butyl, and so I think butyl has a damping coefficient of like 0 0.6, 0 0.7, um, which is a way of saying that uh, you know sixty percent, seventy percent of the energy put into it uh, is lost, right, to heat. So if you mm -hmm. if you take a, um, we do this with heights and, and we have a video on our site where I actually do, I've got a, a butyl ball and a latex ball um, and you drop them and the, the latex ball will bounce up, you know, 70% as high as you dropped it from. And the butyl ball maybe bounces up 30% as high. And what's happening is, you know, when the ball hits the ground and it compresses, there's heat created to compress it. And then as it bounces back, there's heat lost in that expansion and it's expanding much slower uh, than it was compressed. And the latex just does it with a much higher efficiency. And so um, when you think of that in terms of your tire, you think as, as the wheel rolls around, you know, as it comes to the ground, you've got a compressed section of tire, right? That's all deformed. And then right in front of that, you've got uh, uncompressed tire. And so it comes down and it has to slowly get compressed compresses to its max. And then as soon as it gets past the halfway point, it actually is able to start pushing back, but it can't push back as fast as it's being pushed in. Mm -hmm. um, and so with latex, it pushes back faster um, and it gives more energy back to the system than has been lost. And so, hmm. um, you know, in a 700 by 28, 700 by 30 road tire, you're talking, it can be three to five Watts per tire. Oh, wow. um, savings. I mean, it's huge. It's, you know, like I say, a, a two, two latex tires is the equivalent of, uh, buying the ceramic wheel bearings and the <laughs> ceramic bottom bracket and the ceramic oversized pulleys, um, <laughs> plus a water. So, right. Wow. <laughs> and, uh, and, and so that's, that's the advantage to latex. The other advantage I like about it, you know, my aversion to a sealant we talked about earlier, the, the latex adds just an a minuscule, I mean, fractions of a watt of loss to the system. Um, and so like when we test a ton of tires uh, and when we ride test them, instead of having to deal with sealant and the tubeless fitting and all that stuff, um, I just take all the tires and run all of them with the latex tubes in them. Um, and you really, as a rider, you can't tell the difference of whether it's being run tubeless or being run with the latex tube. Um, hmm. And only on the test machine, the rolling resistance machine, can you tell by like the fractions of a watt difference that there's a tube in it. Um, but from an operational perspective in the lab, it saves, uh, you know, if we do four or five tire changes a week, running them tubed rather than tubeless saves hours and hours of labor and headache. And mess. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. <laughs> so, yeah, but, but the same is, is true. You know, you look at, uh, we, we talked, I think, uh, in our last, our call about the bar tape that we did. You think the bar tape's another contact patch that uh, 
you know, you want to be supple, right? You don't want damping in your bar tape. You don't want damping in your saddle. Um, and so, you know, we, we did a bar tape using that, uh, that exotic, that crazy foam that Nike worked on to do the two hour marathon shoe. Uh, and it's just, it's a foam that has a much higher energy return, um, than, uh, any of the other foams that people are using. And, but you think about it, you also in bar tape and in grips, you get this packing effect, right? That, that super soft bar tape that feels great in the bike shop. You know, when you, when you put your hand on it, it compresses almost to rigid. And then Mm -hmm. as you go over the bumps, it's not responding quickly enough for you to recompress it. Um, and so that's kind of the irony of like those memory foams and the the self-skinning foam, um, grips and bar tape products out there is that they feel amazing when you squish them. Um, it's slow speed, but just like our hysteresis curve with the tire at high frequencies, uh, they can actually be much, much harsher, um, mm. than a highly reactive foam. And so that's, that's where, uh, you know, like in, we don't make grips, but in grips, you know, the silicone, uh, f- silicone foams tend to just do much better, um, in testing than anything else because they're so responsive. Uh, hmm. and, and that's what we were after with, with the bar tape as well. So yeah, you try to think of anywhere you can put that undamped compliance, uh, you're better off for it. All right, cool. Uh, I'm going to pop in the YouTube chat real quick. We've got college park, Maryland, Seattle, checking in suburban Philadelphia, Cleveland, Ohio, someone from all the way from Wellington, New Zealand. Welcome, uh, Seattle and Cordes. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, Dan Hoops has, is there a calculation for ideal rim width for a given tire width? I think we touched on this a little bit in the last video, um, in terms of like aerodynamics, but what about, I'm curious about wider tires that as, as wide as a tire gets. I, w- I would say that, um, the limiting factor there is that as the, the rim gets wider than the tire, uh, casing, you start to have some safety risk. Uh, hmm. in terms of the, the tire wanting to unbeat itself uh, it, it, as it um, is loaded laterally. And so, um, you know, ideally you want the outside of the rim to be a little wider than the inflated tire. You know, my rule of 105 is, you know, you want the, the rim should be about 105% the width of the inflated tire. That's not always possible. Um, but we're kind of in this interesting point in time where things are changing so quickly uh, you know, we just keep making these ever wider rims, which keep making the <laughs> tires fit ever wider than they were meant to. Um, and it's, it's, it's certainly interesting times. I mean, I, you know, I'm on a setup uh, right now where I think we've, it's a, th- a 30 millimeter tire. I can actually do air quotes on, uh, on the YouTube. Uh, <laughs> and we can work see so it. Well. <laughs> doesn't work so well in the podcast, um, but it's like a, like a, a 30 or 32 millimeter tire on a 20, I think it's a 27 millimeter um, bead width rim. And so it measures out at like 35 millimeters. Uh, um, and it's really, it, it's a beautiful uh, ride quality that you can, you can inflate it low and have all of the, the compliance that you're after. But those, uh, the way the sidewalls are working, um, it corners uh, much stiffer than it rides vertically. And for me, that's probably the sweet spot. We're probably going to end up somewhere. I don't have a good rule of thumb for it yet, but it's probably somewhere in the, you know, 15, having the bead width be like 15 to 20% smaller than the inflated casing width. The Hmm. real challenge we have is, is just coming up with a system where people can figure those two things out without actually buying both items and putting them together. Cause I mean, today that's where we are. It's like, you have to just buy all the stuff and put it together and put calipers on it. Right. Right. And it, and it never, I mean, the only rule of thumb is that it never matches what either product says on the sidewall. <laughs> That's the guarantee. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, let's see what we got here. Uh, Lancaster, PA, Rochester, uh, Minnesota, someone all the way from Romania tuning Ooh. in. Um, let's see. Schlemmer would ask at the ideal calculate pressures or formula for the portion of the tires casing that forms the lateral width of the contact patch. Um, that's, that's a lot of question. I'm not quite sure how to, to, to parse that. Um, so we got Matt M from Portland, uh, Velo Studio is on, um, and, uh, they asked, uh, what is the optimal tire rim relationship when it comes to grip? Oh, um, 
I would, the, the, probably it's probably going to end up somewhere in what we just calculated. I, I I'm going to say it's probably somewhere in that having a bead width 15, 15 to 20% narrower than the tire. Um, I, I could be wrong. You know, we're, we're, we don't have a lot of, um, combinations that get much higher than that. And I know as you mm-hmm. get close to one-to-one, one, there's some safety concern. Um, but yeah, it's, it's probably going to be somewhere in that as wide as possible before we, we have safety risk. Before you get too wide. <laughs> before you get too wide. Yeah, it's, so uh, it depends, right? Yeah, but you, you think of, um, you know, in an automotive tire where you, they steel belt it to keep it flat, uh, you know, you really want it, it. It's like a one-to-one relationship. Um, you know, in a bicycle tire, obviously, because it's the, the cornering, you know, motorcycle tires, uh, you look at MotoGP, it's, they're probably 10% narrower. Uh, but they're cl- they're darn close to matched width right. um, to casing, and so I I think it's probably going to be s- somewhere in that range, a Clo- little bit less than one. Um, you know, it's certainly not going to be anywhere near the uh, uh, you know the fifty fifty five percent. You know what what we were doing <laughs> twenty years ago, right? Where you know a thirteen C rim with a twenty three millimeter tire, um, right? <laughs> you know that we we know that's less than ideal. Um, but yeah, I think that there's a question in there, probably more safety related than anything else of just how far can it be pushed? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, that the, the whole tire tire to rim relationship gets asked a lot. I think that's going to be, and it seems fairly undis- unexplored at the moment um, or consistently. Let's see. Teva from Auckland, New Zealand. Um, Yes. Would you consider a clincher tubeless tire with a tire insert set up for cyclocross racing a good option? Do you have much experience with, with, uh, the, the tire inserts and any thoughts on them? You know, I don't, um, or I do, but I can't talk about it. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> uh, probably you have to kill us all. <laughs> yeah, um, so I, I do, I do, uh, have a decent amount um, but honestly, much more from the, uh, the roadside mm-hmm. of things, uh, a lot of stuff that's, that's kind of being considered there to it, it's, I think one of the things that's going to help us get to, um, large scale, <clears throat> excuse me, tubeless adoption in the pro tour, um, for safety more than anything else. Um, I have played with inserts and I would say that my experience, the inserts that are, have like some cross-sectional molding that they fit down kind of into the. Uh, into the channel of the tire um, seem to be what you're going to want and need for like a cyclocross application, right? Because mm-hmm. you're really trying to risk the debeating or the burping um, or, or the, the peeling out of that, uh, of that bead. Um, whereas, you know, I think of, you know, I have some, some experience in, in uh, like mountain bike enduro and, and downhill racing. And, you know, those are, um, uh, some of those products are just awesome, but I mean, really they're just there to just take, you know, be something in the middle to take that massive hit. And, you know, we're, we're generally not running pressures, um, at that absolute low ragged edge. Uh, cause you just, mm-hmm. I mean, th- there's just so much damage, um, that's occurring. So yeah, I, I would say, I, I do think tubeless is the future. Um, I think that there's going to be some solution eventually, um, that stops the uh, debeating, the uh, burping type issues. Uh, and those are gonna be the fastest tires for cyclocross um, eventually. We're, we're not quite there yet. Uh, I mean, I know I've got some, you know, cyclocross pros, um, I mean, running sub 20 PSI um, right now. And they're not, you know, some, some of them are smaller women, but most of them aren't. So, I mean, when you, when you just think of the sheer mechanics of, you know, a a 150 pound, you know, person on a 19 and a half PSI tire like that. I mean, that, wow. (laughs) That's, (laughs) you know, that we are not, we're good. We're getting much better at tubeless, but we are not that good. (laughs) Nice. Uh, Cool. Well, it's, we're coming up to the hour mark. Um, Is there anything new from coming out from Silka that, that we should be looking forward to? 
Oh gosh. Uh, you know, in these crazy times, we, uh, we, we've tried to, you know, like everybody tried to stay in business selling something to somebody. So we, if you're indoor riding, we've got these amazing gear wipes for cleaning the bike that, uh, they neutralize like sweat and proteins and ammonia, which is in a lot of, it's the stuff that makes your handlebars turn white and turn to powder. Um, you know, we did just win the tour magazine in Germany, it's the magazine that does all the testing. Our bar tape won their test, uh, which was awesome. <laughs> um, and so, and it's, we have an indoor specific version that's super cushy. So check that out. And then uh, I will say there, there may or may not be um, a chain lube in our future. And uh, so if you, uh, it's, it's a little TBD right now with all of the uh, uh, world craziness going on now, but I, I, kind of teasing my team of that I we might just release release it without labels or anything because I <laughs> <waiting>. <laughs> little, we've got mm -hmm. we've got just enough supply chain disruption that we can't get the finished product together but we have enough of the finished product in stock that it's like well shit I could sell to somebody right and it's uh right um, but it's pretty there's some pretty cool technology in there that uh also for indoor runs really clean but it runs much much quieter uh than anything I've ever tested um so yeah, a couple things. Yeah, cool. Yeah, you you bring up the the supply chain issues. I I kind of I wouldn't say hoarded, but I stocked up on uh, some chains and some uh, consumables for my bike in anticipation of that. Do you think COVID's going to affect? Um, I mean, how how is it going to affect the industry in terms of supply chain? Oh, it's already affected. Uh, it's, yeah. I, I mean, in a big way. I think it'll. It really depends now how quickly it starts to clean up. But I know, um, you know, like we're we've struggled uh, to get titanium. Um, all of a sudden, it's become really, really challenging to get. Um, you know, transport is really hard to get. You think of something like half half of the air freight uh, that moves around the world travels in the belly of passenger planes, and when there's no mm -hmm. passenger planes, that means you've cut the air freight in half. And so, um, but then we also have uh, fewer ships. Uh, right now because there's issues in, in shipping freight. And so, uh, yeah, we're, we're probably, it's probably going to take everybody six or nine months to really just figure out the freight logistics side of things. Cause you know, these supply chains are so complicated. Right. Uh, you know, I always use our, our ultimate pump, you know, it's 72 subcomponents from 12 uh, or 24 vendors in 12 countries for one product. Right. Right. Any one of those things doesn't show up. You can't make, you know, right. You can't make one. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, you start thinking of all the products in the world that are like that, um, you know, and, and I think two people don't think of the complexities. I know, uh, like our hero bell frame clamp, uh, that we make those silicone, um, protective cups on the end. Well, everything's made in America, except that the silicone is catalyzed with platinum and the platinum all comes from, uh, you know, Asia, <laughs> Right. right. And so kind of the same thing, you know, our suppliers calling us and saying, well, I have everything except platinum, so I can't make you wheels. Right. And if I can't get right. wheels, then I can't, I mean, it just cascading effect. That's going to be our world for, yeah, probably six months or so. Um, yeah. Except for those who are extremely vertically integrated. Right. Uh, <laughs> but that's that other than Shimano, that's probably no one else in our industry. <laughs> right. Wow. Quite honestly. So, <sighs> Yeah, but fingers crossed, you know, or I will say if, you know, if, um, you know, you, if you're bored and you've got money to burn, it's a great time to support the industry because it, it, uh, it, it's a huge challenge. I mean, I know I probably hear from a company a day who's in full panic um, about what they're going to do. You know, we're, we're fortunate that, you know, we've, we've got some indoor products and, you know, we've got some bike maintenance, you know, we've got products that you can buy, you um, to do the stuff that we're all doing when we're stuck at home. Um, but a lot of the companies out there that sell, you know, super specific things, you know, maybe for, for racing, well, there's no racing. Right. And so, I mean, there's a lot of people out there that are, that are really struggling uh, with their businesses right now. So any, uh, any little bit from anybody else, that's for sure. Right. Yeah. Well, cool. Um, thank you, Josh, again, for joining us on channel and sharing your expertise oh, with a, our patrons, the, the folks on YouTube. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed uh, this kind of format. We've got a bunch more planned. I think we actually have a copy outside with our friend Jude uh, tomorrow morning. 
And we're just, you know, like, like Josh, we're, we're trying to adapt our content to, to the new world. Um, <laughs> it's funny, I've been, I've been uh, trying to upgrade our live streaming setup and a lot of the components that I would buy, they're all sold out. So even <laughs> I'm like the, the content creator and like we're, I'm trying to make yeah. do with like with, with what we have. Uh, but thank you again, Josh, for joining no, thank us. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank, thank you, everybody. You yeah. yeah. <laughs> and um, you guys know the drill. Like, share, subscribe if you like this content. Uh, if you want to support the channel, consider uh, you know joining us on Patreon. Uh, you get lots of cool perks. Actually, Silka is uh, one of the supple perks. You get a nice discount on uh, some of their gear. That really helps us out a lot, and you guys get a discount. We've also got our uh, fun party pay stickers, artwork, all that good stuff. Um, so that's it. Uh, join us tomorrow. And as always, keep the supple side down. Thanks, everybody. Okay, ending the live stream. And okay.